I start this final lecture with a fragment of a song. Sitting in this field, I remember how we were going to sit in this field, but never quite did. Rain or appointments or something. Sitting in this field, I remember how we were going to sit in this field but never quite did rain or appointments or something rain or appointments that is the second verse of a song just under 40 years old called it's a fine day its words were written by an experimental poet called, from manchester called edward barton and it was released in 1983 on an indie label. It was sung, unaccompanied, to a haunting little tune by a woman who was not a professional singer, Jane Lancaster. He paid her a fiver to record it. She sings it as if no one can hear her, sometimes falling into a hum or using wordless syllables half under her breath. The tenses of its first, which is also its last verse. It's a fine day. People open windows. They leave their houses just for a short while. They shift from the intensely local present to the immediate future of tonight and tomorrow. It's going to be a fine night tonight. It's going to be a fine day tomorrow. It should be carefree. And perhaps it is. The private pastoral of the voice is hard to read. This repeated middle verse that I just sang you, though, is, is more circular, more ambiguous. It casts its shadow backwards and forwards across the whole song, for its voice is remembering and mourning something that never quite happened. Where I am now, she sings, is somewhere I never quite managed to be because I was somewhere else that didn't matter as much. The tune's centre of gravity is a little circular phrase we first hear to sitting in this field. Grammatically, it is a dependent clause on the main verb for the whole verse, I remember. The notes for I remember sound as if they're going to follow that same musical phrase, but then they elongate into an unexpectedly long descending cluster, setting words couched in the tense sometimes called future in the past. I remember how we were going to. It returns, though, to its original circular phrase, which we will hear echoed to the words sit in this field but never quite did the throwaway last line rain or appointments or something placeholders for events the singer cannot even recollect climbs back up the scale and then drops hanging in the air a major third above the tonic she circles around to the beginning and she repeats the verse she begins to repeat its last phrase. Rain or appointments or something. But she runs out of impetus two words early and she lets them go, hanging this time on the dominant, a perfect fifth above the tonic. Rain or appointments. I've had to use a lot of description and a lot of time to explain something your ears instinctively heard as circular, short, unfinished, fragmented. In the major key throughout, it is plain sad. Its understatement, its undescribed domesticity, the story it doesn't tell, all these only make it sadder. The song, It's a Fine Day, or rather its first verse, 
has had some strange afterlives. It was the backing track for a surreal Japanese advert for Kleenex in 1986, where tissues flew away like doves, repeating and repeating, from a woman in white sitting by a child dressed as an ogre. For viewers, this seemed to speak of despair and suicide, and the advert was quickly withdrawn. Urban legends grew up around it of curses if it were watched at midnight. Six years later, in 1992, It's a Fine Day became a hugely successful semi-ambient dance track, and it's been extensively covered on the clubbing scene. More recently, in 2017, the unaccompanied song has been beautifully rendered by the singer Billy Martin. When people look for ways to connect fleetingness with forever, their most common recourse is repetition. The circular medium of a repeated action or sound imposes an image of restoration upon the ever-rolling stream of linear time. Or, as Adam Seligman puts it in his book, Ritual and its Consequences, repetition can mitigate the effects of time, denying the ontological character of the new in favour of what is beyond time. It can mitigate the effects of time, denying the ontological character of the new in favour of what is beyond time. For this reason, rituals of worship, including Christian ones, employ repetition in a huge variety of ways. These range from the repetition of liturgical patterns and the reiteration of those patterns across times and seasons, to the repetition of actions and words within liturgical structure, to repetition within that highly evocative medium of pattern, rhythm and sound, music. The current worshipping culture of Anglicanism borrows its contemplative range of musical repetition very largely from Roman Catholicism in plain chant and in teze chant. According to the RSCM, the teze chant, Wait for the Lord, which repeats two simple phrases, is one of the most popular songs downloaded from one license by Protestant churches during lockdown, and you can see why. There is a separate genre of ecstatic repetition which grew out of the charismatic tradition. It is now a standard feature of any worship reliant on expressive emotional response, and it's not easy to do on Zoom. Eucharistic worship has a slightly cautious relationship with ecstatic repetition because its liturgy keeps such a tight hold on intellectual and cognitive assent. It is, perhaps rightly, suspicious of overriding the deliberate thought process of its stages through techniques that are going to make you feel stuff, whether you want to or not. The uncomfortable, unstable relationship between the grammar of ascent and the repetitions of ecstasy has been playing out in Christian worship for centuries. Whether we think of John Wesley's discomfort with his ecstatically worshipping early Methodists out in the woods, and he was particularly worried, by the way, by ecstatic women, or the massive difference between the cresting rush of a repeated evangelical chorus and the tightly controlled use of repetition in the music of Jonathan Dove or James Macmillan. The music, handmade to worship, is also inclined to get out of hand. It disrupts our sense of time. It brings personal memory into the present with terrifying immediacy. It acts upon our bodies so that we weep or uplifted or roused in some other way without us ever quite deciding it. In modern culture, music is the emotional background to living. It is everywhere, mostly in recorded rather than live form. It is not at all weird to us that we live constantly with precise electronic repetition of a past sound. But that is 
a really weird thing. It's never happened before in the history of the world. All day, every day, memory can be brought vividly into present feeling by the exact replication of songs heard at another stage of life. In first love, first loss, in bitterness or bereavement or trouble. Often those songs are sung by the dead, and even those singers who still live will be more present, present to us in their lost, young, carefree forms than in the ageing selves and bodies in the world now. Perfectly repeating and technologically enhanced so that most recorded music bears the same relationship to living human instruments as a cyberman does to a real person, the artificial heartbeat of the music industry imposes constant, deliberate disruption upon our sense of time, duration and memory. It is, itself, a kind of worship. Some of its forms generate intense feeling through a technological formula which has almost nothing to do with our irregular, faulty bodies, as if there might be some reliable electronic key to a slice of eternity. The music industry's internal arguments about embodiedness and physical action in community on the one hand versus an over-perfect technological imitation on the other mirror with some precision the arguments about technologically enabled sacramental experience. Today, I play you no recorded music, but I am, of course, being recorded. <laughs> The deliberate repetitions of minimalism flourished within music in the latter part of the 20th century, just about the same time as some fully paid up versions of Christian worship became fed up with repetition and started to flirt with the unpredictable, the unrehearsedly sincere and the fiercely propositional. Outside the Christian orbit though, Musicians and artists were falling in love with time games. Inevitably, the repetitive possibilities offered by technology were significant. In 1971, the composer Gavin Bryars left a tape loop running in order to transfer a recording he'd made of an unnamed tramp singing a fragment of an evangelical hymn, Jesus, Love Never Failed Me Yet. He came back from his lunch break to find the students in his block silent, somber and tearful as they constantly re-experienced its shakily mortal affirmation of absolute trust. Jesus' love never failed me yet, never failed me yet. Jesus' love never failed me yet. There's one thing I know that he loves me so. The fragment ends on an unfinished phrase, so that the ear's impetus to send us back to the beginning stutters a little. The tonic is hardly in that little bit of tune at all, actually. In the composer's own words, it repeated in a slightly unpredictable way. Briars gave it a simple backing of ever-building strings, and it ex exists at several different lengths, running from 25 minutes to one recording of over an hour made with the singer Tom Waits. In my experience, listening to it banishes the awkward division between devotional and aesthetic experience, and I cannot hear it unmoved or bear it often. Who the original singer was is not known. The history of Edward Barton's song, It's a Fine Day, shows the tension between embodied and unbodied repetition, especially starkly. The song began as a deliberately unprofessional, unaccompanied piece of reflection about the nature of everyday loss. Then it was played by John Peel. And the circular form it chose for recording a fleeted moment attracted the attention of a rising industry 
constructing mass transcendental experience electronically. Rave culture was by then a little bit bored of sequencing fragments of Gregorian chant, which it had done quite a lot up till then. In this song's dance music, Afterlife, the joy of it is in the lyrical, fully human fragility of the singing voice, heard against the drivingly perfect repetitions of its artificial world. The dance version pushes away the original song's sense of loss in favour of an endlessly perfect moment. But the viewers of the Japanese advert it backed heard despair. I don't find it surprising that its middle verse was never modified or set to backing because that verse is about time that was never enjoyed, about what was not remembered. Even its repetition is an interrupted one. This is time robbed, not spent, roads not taken or somehow blocked. Much of the mourning involved in recalling the past is in the contemplation of those blocked roads, memories lost, the narrowing of possibility with the passing of time, stuff we never quite did. This final lecture considers the Eucharist in the fourth dimension, the dimension of time. In contemplating the Eucharist in time, we ponder a ritual event built on Jesus' command to eat bread and share wine together in remembrance of me. It recollects backwards in its reinstantiating of the single past event of Jesus' actions at the Last Supper, and it does this through imitating his words and actions in stylized form. But it also repeats forwards because it does it again and again. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, writes Paul to the Christians of Corinth. And he's picking up words he's ascribed to Jesus, do this as often as you drink. The words Paul records in his letters, he describes as received from the Lord and handed on to you. So this is the earliest of our New Testament documents of witness in relation to the Eucharistic rite. It is already in a cycle of repetition, subject not only to the preserving properties of memory, but also to its gaps, its forgettings, and its distortions. Like all remembering, this is interrupted repetition, changing the nature of what it preserves in the act of its preservation. What makes it live is not that Jesus did and said exactly these things at the Last Supper. We trust that he did, but we do not know. Paul was not there and never met Jesus in the flesh. What makes communion live is that in the reinstantiation of his words and actions in the ritual, Jesus says and does those things now and here. If there are times, past and future, I desire to know where they are, writes St. Augustine as he considers the nature of memory. But if, as yet, I do not succeed, I still know, wherever they are, that they are not here as future or past, but as present. Communion is what the past is doing now, present and active, powerful in the living bodies and words and actions of the body of Christ in our time and our place, in what we do and hear and feel and speak and remember. The letter to the Hebrews pondered the difference between ritual offerings repeated over and over by flawed mortals and the sacrifice of himself made once for all by the Son of God. Unlike the other high priests, runs its argument, Jesus has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath 
which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Were this visual of one ritual offering to be the whole story, repeated sacramental worship would be redundant, once and then never again. But this too is an argument about what God does not need, not an argument about what human beings do need. Unlike Jesus, we are subsisting in time and space, in the mortal here and now. We need an image and a means for how our fleetingness and God's forever come together, or we will fall subject to despair. For that, we need to keep bringing the mess and the chaos, the violence and loss of the world as it is, into the ritual space we set up to replicate God's blessed forever. What happened comes into the house of what is always happening and sits with it together and eats at its table, writes Patricia Lockwood. As well as the instantiation of Jesus' presence, both in the act of remembering and in the anticipation of the timeless heaven for which the sip and taste of a token amount of bread and wine represent a brief glimpse, our own memories in all their imperfection and loss and aporia, also come to the holy table. This is not just about the memory of Jesus. This is about the memories we bring to remembering Jesus. The experience of Eucharist is not a spectator experience, not something to emerge from unchanged. Each time we go into its process, we make ourselves subject to a reversal of mind, a change of heart. Eucharist includes an act of repentance for a reason, but all throughout the experience of the Eucharistic rite, we are being turned towards a different way of inhabiting life. We are led into what John's Gospel calls abiding or dwelling in the Jesus who we take into ourselves in Eucharist. The long history of arguments about how wide the time gap should be between personal reiterations of the change process of Eucharist happened because of our differences about how we think Eucharist works its change upon us, how deliberately active we think we might need to be in that change. The manuals of devotion common to the centuries before our own concentrated on a long preparatory discipline of realization, demanding much emotional labor. The sign that Eucharist had wrought its change was often said to be tears. We break, we melt, we fall if we are to hope to stand. One technical name for this process is the Greek word metanoia. Yet metanoia, literally mind change, before it became a technical term for the conversion of the soul, personified the experience of regret and loss, literally personified it. Metanoia was the shadowy goddess of the mist moment, the darker twin to Kairos, god of opportunity. And you see a bas relief in Thebes, which uh, shows you Kairos, the god of opportunity, quite chunky, with wings, standing on the goddess Fortune. That's the unfortunate lady underneath his foot. But Metanoia is off to the left with her hand, her head on her hand, looking very dejected, re regretting lost opportunity. Later on, Philo of Alexandra repurposed Metanoia as the attentive handmaid to Christian transformation through the miracle of grace. But much of her makeup, the natural qualities she possesses of sorrow and remorse, send us not towards fulfillment, but towards regret, not just for what has passed, but for what never came to be, and not just for remembering, but for what memory no longer retains. 
It is a sense of this dark character of metanoia, which has T.S. Eliot in his poem of ambiguous repentance, Ash Wednesday, begin with an interrupted repetition, shifting the iteration of its first line, because I do not hope to turn again, to the shorter, differently bleak, because I do not hope. The theology of the Eucharist is full of beautiful, satisfying balances and paradoxes when we consider how it works in time. We balance history against eschatology, time against eternity, simple against mysterious, single against repeated, occasional against constant. I could talk about these, and many have. I could talk, for example, about Plato's theory in the Timaeus of time as a working model of eternity, a succession of constantly repeating present moments which attempt to make repetition stand for changeless reality, like, as C.S. Lewis talking about it put it, trying to imitate omnipresence by visiting as many places as possible in rapid succession. The repetitions of Eucharist could be seen as that kind of constant rehearsal across time, taking the once for all of Jesus' sacrificial self-offering and making it into a working model of his continual presence. In such a theory of the Eucharist in time, our work must be the continual reinsertion of the world's losses in time and space into the iterated model in order to bring our mortality together with his divinity. And yes, I do think that. I find it a most beguiling and helpfully neat pattern. It's just that in practice, there's nothing remotely neat about it. The materials themselves, words and bodies, even the flawed human attention itself are full of slippage. However much we, like the Emperor Constantine, fill the spaces of our holy ritual with rich adornment, the ground upon which we pile them is still the lost remains of a garden full of signs and remnants. When I look back upon the childhood reading that shaped me, I notice how much of it was about living among the ruins of a vanished past. A past that exerted its power, even in ruins, upon the less charged, more malleable present. Tolkien's imagined world was a world in decline, full of signs and remnants, barrows and broken towers, some, like the outpost of Mordor called Athelion, still beautiful as well as wrecked. Others, blessed but withdrawing from human knowledge like the sylvan paradise of Lothlorien. C.S. Lewis brought the vicious remnant of a vanished world into his brand new Narnia in The Magician's Nephew. But first, his protagonists ran through an ancient civilization, shaking itself to pieces. You may see an echo of the video game in that picture. Other books, many of them, used the time travel device, inserting past people and places into present experience. The past is fully present for Tom, the boy in Philippa Pierce's Tom's Midnight Garden, who finds himself in the vanished garden of the Edwardian house at which he stays, over and over inhabiting the memories of the present-day old lady sleeping upstairs. Its point of crisis uses words from Revelation written upon the grandfather clock existing in both times. There shall be time no longer. The 1974 television adaptation of Tom's Midnight Garden chose for its credit music the opening of a Greek nocturne, Opus 54, where the same note, repeated over and over, changes its meaning as the bass note shifts downwards. It was an inspired choice for a drama of realised memory, a haunting. Within the rite of Eucharist, the iteration of the same words, the same actions across a life of worship, 
sets up a different structure from the linear for the action of time. Layered into its structure, not horizontally, but vertically, going deep and deeper, while the top layer, like a repeated note, remains unaltered, is the past, present and active. Every time I speak the prayer of humble access at the early Book of Common Prayer communion service, there rises up before me the dark shine of old wood in an exceptionally beautiful Suffolk church, decades and decades ago. With it also arises a chaotic anguish I never otherwise remember, lost with the turmoil of that particular bad time, poured into the words, Thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Coming towards the end of the acclamation, renew us with your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, which was passed over unaltered from uh, the ASB to common worship. I see the face of the vicar in the church where I discovered worship as a teenager, exhorting his congregation in a voice just a little too loud. Everyone should say these words together. They are for us all. The mixture of embarrassment and curiosity I felt is preserved in the amber of the words themselves, along with a strong affection. I didn't know then what he was trying to teach us, but I do know now. I don't remember his name. A congregation member whose long-term illness means that she can neither come to church nor eat food watches the live stream of the Eucharist her husband is attending. He sits in sight of the camera with an empty seat beside him. On the screen rises the church she has not entered for ten years, populated with a community of which she is a part and which she can never physically join. As the time comes to receive, she sees her husband take and eat the bread and she visualizes herself beside him, taking and eating. The recollection of Christ's body, wafer, community, intimacy, feeds her as she has never been fed by the home communions that she regularly receives. Memory is present now and here, working for her strength and comfort. Speaking with people who have received communion over many years, I am struck by how often the beloved dead are present in the circle of those who receive. Fathers and husbands, wives and mothers, children and lovers and friends, invoked through the reiterations from past to present, never closer than in the taking of bread and wine. Meeting to discuss a village funeral, the dead man's daughter says, I always think of the words we say every week. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. She remembers that the words were said by a centurion and that the much-loved church in which the funeral will take place has Roman pillars. The connection brings a remembered Jesus into her own place, her own time, and she holds on to that. I bring communion at home to a beloved parishioner. We have prayed together for years. He is dying. He weeps as he receives. Outside the big glass doors of the room we're in, the grey light shines like water at sundown and drops of rain tremble on the plants he loves to grow, bright as crystal. These are undramatic, everyday examples, they're also some of them examples of grief that is hard to handle. But the iterations of Eucharist must take the disjunctive and the violent, as well as the ordinary ills the flesh is heir to. In February 2020, the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, an American Presbyterian minister in New York, 
offered a communion which memorialised Trayvon Martin, the black teenager shot in a random encounter in 2012, whose death was inexplicably not treated as murder. Instead of bread and wine, the congregation shared sweets and iced tea, the snacks he bought from the 7-Eleven minutes before being shot. The symbolic overlay of that violent death, a death which should never have happened, with God's deliberate sacrifice, makes, in one respect, perfect emotional sense. Like the many ways in which Jesus is brought into the time and place of human suffering, it puts human time and God's time together. Yet Twitter responses included a fair bit of outrage. For some, the alteration of the right made straightforwardly blasphemous claims. For others, it eliminated the sacred altogether. I don't think those things, and it moves me. But I do think it came too close to making the suffering of Trayvon Martin carry a burden which he could not carry. It was properly and once for all Jesus' own who carries all our burdens. Random violence is not redemption. It is destruction. Human beings bring their sorrows to the foot of the cross, but the person it holds is Jesus. That particular communion does bring, though, something into view which is otherwise hard to see. On the night that he was betrayed, begins the re-narration, the reiteration of the acts of the Last Supper. We quickly understand from that that we mark the crisis of a life, the meaning of a life, even perhaps the high point of a life in the reiteration of Eucharist. But our hindsight makes it much harder to see that we are also marking the tragic interruption of a life. It's shrinking down of choices, possibilities, it's vista of ordinary joys into one grim trajectory. This young, healthy, extraordinary man will be tortured and killed for no good reason. He will be taken away from the web of relationships, of loving and being loved, of doing and being done unto. In the garden at Gethsemane, Jesus mourns the vanishment of futures that will never come to be, that are ordained never to be. Sitting in this field, I remember how we were going to sit in this field. His disciples will not see any meaning in what happens next in spite of all Jesus' own efforts to help them see it, because the future they envisaged was full of miraculous meals and thrones and liberated glory. Asked on the road to Emmaus about the political news from Jerusalem, the travelling companions of Jesus stood still, looking sad. They say to the ignorant stranger who asks them, we had hoped that he was the one. For them, Violent death is not the meaning. It takes away the meaning. How can the cruelty which destroys lives be the meaning? Most deaths do not have obvious meanings. The deaths of the young can look most obviously pointless, and even martyrs as they gamble meaning against continuing to exist cannot know whether the death they die will blossom in the dust simply blow away, forgotten on the wind. Eucharist does not only hold the meaning of death, it brings its meaninglessness to the holy table and shows it with anguish, asking how the loss could ever be given its true worth. And sometimes that loss is violent. And often it is the everyday shrinking of possibility, the slow death of hope. Barton's lyric traces the commonest and most pervasive experience of time-bound loss. 
W. H. Auden's early ballad, When I Walked Out One Evening, expresses the same gradual emptying of the world. In headaches and in worry, vaguely life leaks away, and time will have its fancy, tomorrow or today. This is the loss of what might have been in the future, and now never will be. I remember how we were going to sit in this field, but never quite did. Rain or appointments or something. During these days of Easter, having laid the table with the bread and the wine, we make this offertory prayer. Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen High Priest. Make yourself known in the breaking of the bread. Behind this invocation lies the experience of the Emmaus travellers who could not see meaning in Jesus' death. Though they did not recognise who was walking alongside them, they said of him later, did not our hearts burn within us when he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Before ever they could name who was speaking, his words restored a present meaning to the meaningless absence of the man they were mourning. For them, the moment of recognition, the point where they knew that memory had become present as a living person, as Jesus, was at the breaking of the bread. Yet, as they saw what they saw and knew what they knew, the present Jesus vanished from their sight, leaving only the bread broken upon the table. We don't know if they ate the bread he broke. Luke tells us only that that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven apostles saying to each other, He has risen indeed. Then, says Luke, they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. All over the defaced garden of this world lie the signs and remnants of the Lord's presence, like broken bread on an empty table. Our Lord shows himself in the possibilities we realise in the ritual of Eucharist, where the quick promise of what might or could be gives us the impetus to act with hope. He shows himself in the signs and patterns we make, in the schemes of devotion which hold our attention. He shows himself too in the fracturing of those same schemes of knowledge, where breaks in perception and argument like cracks in a pavement make spaces for green plants to serve our need. He shows himself in the drama of making, in sacred place that invites and eases prayer, in the sacred actions by which we inhabit his holiness. He shows himself in the stuttering repetitions by which we connect our time to his eternity, and he shows himself when we fail to make those connections. He is not a ghost. He scatters our lives with gifts of meaning more than we can count. He brings us home. And when these failing lips grow dumb And mind and memory flee When thou shalt in thy kingdom Jesus, remember me. Thank you for your attention. It's been marvellous to give these lectures.
So, Jessica, it's been marvellous to hear them. So thank you very much. I'm not sure where you are, but thank you so much for a really inspiring, thoughtful set of lectures. We haven't had any Bampton lectures on liturgy for um, quite a long time. And this is especially timely, I think, as so many of us have grappled with what it has meant to worship online. It's raised lots of questions for us about the nature of liturgy, especially the nature of the Eucharist. And you've answered those questions and many, many more, or at least you've raised many, many more, which I think is the most important thing, uh, in a really um, inspiring way, using poetry and music and theology and anthropology and history. So thank you. I know that I will go on thinking about them for a long time afterwards, as I'm sure many others will. And I also know that I look forward to the book of the lectures. So um, can I ask you all to join me once again, thanking Jessica for a fabulous set of lectures. Thank you.